Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are having a good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. My name is Macy Morin, and I am a Communications and Engagement Manager here with the Office of Internet Connectivity and Growth at uh, NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. So I appreciate you all joining us for what we're calling our Broadband 101 a webinar today where we'll be going uh, through, you know, definitions, technology, um, basically giving you a really good overview of the entire cycle and system of, of broadband and high-speed internet. Um, I'll be joined today by Court Buffington, who is a technical advisor on our team um, here at OICG within NTIA. And um, But before that, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, you are more than welcome to submit questions at any time throughout the webinar. Uh, we will be collecting those and asking uh, and have a moderated Q&A session towards the end of the webinar once Court finishes his formal presentation. So you can submit those using the Q&A box on your Zoom module. It should be on the bottom uh, labeled Q&A. So with that, if you have any questions, feel free, uh, technical issues or technical questions, feel free to uh, send those to the hosts and panelists. Otherwise, uh, we will talk to you after the Q&A session. So Court, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Macy. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, today, we've got quite a bit of information packed into this slide deck. Uh, we're gonna cover seven topics kind of broadly. This is certainly not a deep dive in any one of these areas, uh, though there may be some more deep dives coming in the next several months. We're gonna to touch on, on some concepts and definitions with broadband and high-speed internet, an overview of the bipartisan infrastructure law pro funding programs, uh, a little bit about what happens when you send information through the internet, some key broadband terms, some different connection types, and then a little bit about the economics of deploying broadband. Uh, so big question here, broadband or high-speed internet? Uh, we hear both of these terms used pretty frequently. So um, broadband definition in telecommunications, it means wide bandwidth that can transport multiple signals over a broad range of frequencies simultaneously uh, and support different internet traffic types. It kind of a way to look at this is a connection that is broadband is, the, is a connection that can support multiple different data streams at the same time effectively. High-speed internet is more of a generic term used for internet service that is faster than average. Okay, well, what does faster than average mean? Uh, traditionally, this was it was determined to be a high-speed connection if a connection could support multiple devices simultaneously, allowing them streaming access to multiple modern applications. So for the most part, you'll hear the term high-speed internet and broadband used fairly interchangeably. Uh, FCC standards refer to broadband and high-speed internet as uh, faster than 25 megabits per second down, downstream and three megabits per second for upstream. And for the purposes of this presentation, when I say the words high-speed internet, I'll be referring to the service that is provided uh, to the end user. And when I say broadband, I'll be usually talking about the technologies used to deliver. So a little bit uh, to scope the reason why we're doing this. Why are we here? An estimated 17 million Americans still don't have high-speed internet. The problem is much worse on tribal lands. And 90, while 95.6% of households have access, only 68.9% of households subscribe to service at a level that's 25.3 or higher. So we have got a lot of work to do. Adoption is uneven across communities in the United States. So when we talk about bringing internet to all, getting internet to every American, it's not just getting access to the service, it's also making sure that the service is affordable. It's ensuring that everybody has access to the devices and the training and the skills they need to function in the digital economy and to make those internet connections work for them. And finally, it's about workforce development. 77% of jobs require some sort of technology skills, and almost half of hiring managers say that candidates lack skills needed to fill open jobs. 
lack of digital literacy and digital skills uh, is a major factor in whether students move on to post-secondary studies. And more than 12 million households don't even have access to a computer, tablet, or smartphone. Well, it's really hard to be prepared and to be able to use the technologies going to work or going to school when you don't have access to them at home. So uh, why high-speed internet matters? We've got a, several things listed on this slide here, and I'm just gonna pick off a couple. I mean, the thing that we hear the most about, of course, we hear about things like, like healthcare and telehealth and how important that was during the pandemic, public safety, uh, public safety uses, um, education, telework. But, you know, even things like entertainment are important. And that's another thing that we've learned in the last three years. Being able to communicate with family and friends or even just get entertainment content. It's all important. All of these things are extremely important. High-speed internet arguably delivers all of the aspects of our modern lives at one level or another. Okay, a bit about the bipartisan infrastructure law broadband funding programs. There are four programs that we focus on here at OICG supporting the bipartisan infrastructure law. The biggest one is broadband equity access and deployment or BEAD. Uh, you've probably, if you've been following along stuff on our website, you've probably heard of BEAD before. BEAD is the big one. And most of what we'll be talking about today will be in reference to equity access and deployment in the BEAD program. There's also the digital equity program. It does focus on ensuring that everybody has the skills, the capability to uh, participate in a digital economy. Tribal broadband is a carve out specifically serving our tribal communities uh, and enables a broad, uh, a broad spectrum of different uh, components to that program. And our middle mile program, which applications for our middle mile program have been closed now since the end of September. And uh, those applications are going through a grant evaluation and awarding process today. Most of the stuff we talk about in here focused on BEAD. Uh, middle mile is something that's gonna come up again later, but for right now, middle mile is the connectivity that makes the last mile connectivity under BEAD work. All right, so the fun part, I am, uh, I'm an engineer and a network guy, so I tend to really like this part of the presentation. This is my favorite, and it's a fairly common question. How does the internet work? So this is kind of a simplified view, and we've picked some devices that are the most common things that you'd typically see in a home. Uh, but before I go into how packets move back and forth through the network, I want to define a few things. Um, some terms, bit, we talk about bit is in bits per second. A bit is a logical unit, single logical unit. We call it an atomic unit. It cannot be subdivided any smaller. It's a yes or a no, a one or a zero, a true or a false, the smallest unit of information that we can have. And in networks, we measure their speed, which is actually a flow rate in bits per second, because this is one of the earliest ways to transmit data. It was sent serially one bit at a time down a wire. The wire has a signal on it or it doesn't, on or off, one or zero. Uh, so we began characterizing the speed of digital communication in bits per second. Next is a byte. A byte is a group of eight bits of data. It represents a number in binary. So uh, early computers performed computations on segments of data that were eight bits wide to form a byte. Uh, and today, larger sizes are common when you hear things like a computer that, uh, you know, or an operating system that's 32 bits or 64 bit. Well, that's the size of a unit of data they can process in, in one operation. Uh, but we've standardized on the byte, similar to standardizing on the bit uh, as a unit of data. So when we talk about things like, oh, that email attachment, I couldn't send it to you. It was 20 megabytes in size. So bits we tend to associate with speed or the flow rate of data. Bytes we associate with things like the size of files. 
Next is packet, sometimes called a frame. And uh, I will do this throughout the presentation. I will say packet or frame kind of interchangeably. Networks work more efficiently when they group a number of bytes together and transmit a larger chunk of data down the line. So this is either a packet or a frame, depending on the exact part of the network that we're talking about. And finally, I mentioned that in everything we talk about, remember, the internet is a network of networks. It is not just one network and there is no entity that controls the whole thing. All right, so getting into what happens here. So the devices we have here, we show an end user using, you know, that looks like a laptop in a picture, picture. could be any device. Uh, and we've got the most typical home device is the Wi-Fi router and a modem. Uh, the Wi-Fi router is kind of an interesting animal. Most of us have them. It actually does several different things. It is a wireless access point. They're usually an Ethernet switch. They've got multiple wired ports on the back you can plug into. And they perform the network address translation function of a router that allows multiple different devices on our home networks to share the single connection from the internet service provider. And then most of our connections have a modem. Modem stands for modulator demodulator. Uh, the key takeaway here is the type of networks that we have in our houses are uh, fairly simple. They have to transmit data over relatively short distances, but the uh, types of encoding protocols and standards that we have to use out in the ISP network that's moving data over a much greater distance and aggregating together with other homes in the neighborhood are significantly more complicated. So the modem's job is to translate between those two, uh, two different signaling standards between the home network and on the ISP side. And there are multiple different standards, whether you're with, whether you have fiber to the home, whether you have a cable connection or DSL, et cetera. So what happens? So, you want to say you want to go load a website. The first thing you do, you type in the URL, you click a link, something, and a stream of data starts. It heads over either your wireless connection. Oh, excuse me. Heads over your wireless connection. And there we have a bunch of bits of data that are grouped together in bytes, and the bytes are formed into packets and they're sent up to the Wi Fi router or maybe over the wireless wired connection. They only really need to go one place, one or the other. But again, stream of data, a bunch of bits packed into bytes, packed into packets, sent off to the Wi-Fi router, which does some processing, then passes the information on to the modem. And you know these are baseband digital signals in our house, then the modem modulates them into more high order analog signals running over typically their coaxial cable, uh, fiber optic, and in some cases still twisted pair of copper. And off to the data center where the server is that is holding the web page that you're trying to access, you know, that, that could be across town or across the world. It doesn't really matter. That's the beauty of the network. Uh, and then in the other way, that the other direction, data comes back, then the page starts to load on your equipment. So a lot happens here. Now, when we get out into the wide area network or the provider network, it's not just one network. There's, uh, there's a lot of different networks out there. It's rarely the case that you go from your home to your ISP and that data is delivered directly to say a data server where you know maybe you're watching a movie on Amazon Prime where it might be located or Netflix or whatever. That data is likely going to go through multiple different networks run by multiple different network operators. It's largely going to run uh, over fiber optic systems. Some of those are gonna be aerial. Some of them are gonna be buried underground. And it's gonna get, the data is gonna get switched and routed through the network. At every time it gets to a major network node, there's gonna be a decision made on how to forward the traffic down, which link to get it to the destination most efficiently. And when all of this happens and your request gets up to the server at the other end, then it turns around and starts sending data back to load the page the exact same way. So an awful lot of stuff is going on there in the background. And that stuff happens literally in the blink of an eye or, or hopefully in the blink of an eye.
again, the most important thing, most important takeaway here is uh, not any single entity controls this entire path. And that is both one of the wonders and frustrations of the internet, right? Uh, that all of these different networks can work together and for the most part works pretty seamlessly to deliver information to us. Of course, the bad part of that is, is there's no 1-800 internet you can call when there's a problem. Some key broadband terms. Okay, we kind of touched on this with broadband versus high-speed internet, but going a little deeper, the term broadband was introduced uh, in the late 90s, and it commonly refers to high-speed internet access that's always on and faster than traditional dial-up. So when we started seeing the term broadband used, that was really based on the early connections that didn't involve using our phone lines and tying up the phone lines, something that was on all the time and uh, significantly faster than our original dial-up modem connections. Those high-speed transmission technologies allowed significantly faster data movements. Well, at, at the time, they certainly seemed a lot faster. High-speed internet is delivered uh, with generally two broad classes of technology. It's either over some type of physical wire or cable. It could be copper, it could be you know, twisted pair, coax, could be fiber optic, and that's wired broadband connections. The other is wireless technology. This could be through a wireless ISP. It could be through a, a cellular network, like a 5G network, et cetera. And that's wireless broadband. Both of the methods are completely capable of delivering high-speed internet, but they have different strengths and weaknesses, and they do it in different ways. So we don't get into too many conversations about this stuff without talking about how the FCC defines broadband. So currently the FCC defines broadband as a transmission speed of at least 25 megabits per second downstream. That's from the internet provider to the end user and three megabits per second upstream. That's from the user's computer or home, whatever, up to the internet. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, that's another name for the bipartisan infrastructure law, defines underserved broadband as an internet speed of less than 100 megabits per second downstream and 20 megabits per second upstream. By the way, we also define less than 25 down and three up as unserved for the purposes of the, of the BIL programs. There are some uh, other criteria that go along with this. We'll talk more about in just a minute, but it's not just speed. It's also reliability of the network and the latency in the network. Hopefully latency makes you say, hmm, what's that? Right around the corner. So I, I talked earlier about the middle mile program. I talked about bead supporting the last mile. So let's take a second here and, and define really what are these things? What's last mile, what's middle mile? So I'm gonna go from left to right on this diagram. There's quite a bit of stuff going on here. So we start with what's kind of the core internet backbone. This tends, uh, we tend to see the access points. I mean, it has to run across the nation, across the world, but the places where you gain access to the core internet backbone typically are in large metropolitan areas, uh, bigger cities. And in those cities, there are a number of facilities. Sometimes they're owned by the telcos themselves. Sometimes they're independently owned. They're often called, um, they're, they may be called data centers. They may be called co-location facilities or colo centers. Uh, they are usually either near or contain an IXP. That's an internet exchange, a place where multiple providers, big and small, or even content providers that uh, that are providing the content that we're going, that the internet's going to deliver all connect together uh, because the networks have to connect together somewhere to make all of this work. So at an exchange point, we tend to see large connections from large carriers and a large number of entities. <clears throat> That's what we define here as the middle mile interconnect facility. This is where all of the ultimately all of the downstream distribution that gets out into the states and the smaller population areas, out to rural areas, et cetera, all focuses. 
or on these middle mile interconnect facilities in major metro areas. When we move from that point out, we talk about this being the distribution or the middle mile network. Uh, the bead NOFO defines uh, NOFO, that's Notice of Funding Opportunity. Those are the rules of the program that we're all working within. It defines uh, middle mile connectivity as connectivity that does not connect directly to an end user. So this is the kind of connectivity that goes between larger providers and smaller providers, between providers of the same size, between content carrier, uh, content providers and, and the larger exchange points. And there are, there are aggregation facilities farther away from those metro centers where we tend to see uh, connections uh, come together and aggregate together. But the focus here isn't necessarily to exchange data at that point. It's more about aggregating those connections together and bringing them back to one of the major middle mile interconnect facilities. This is largely fiber optics at this level. These tend to be very, very high bandwidth connections. They're carrying, uh, you know, they are carrying the data for hundreds of thousands or more people. Uh, there are some very high speed wireless licensed technologies that do operate at this, at this level. So that, <clears throat> that gets out, dis distributes from the major metro centers um, out across the land. And then we land at what, we are, what we're calling the point of presence. This is sort of the switchover point from that middle mile transport, where the job is just to move bulk data from areas farther out. I don't want to say rural because it still may be smaller metropolitan areas, but moving that data from locations farther out back to the major metros. This is where we tend to see a technology change occur. We hop from the technologies used for that really high speed bulk data transport into the technologies that get used for last mile delivery out to our homes and businesses. So it might jump to a wireless technology at this point. Uh, it might be a satellite uplink uh, up to the satellite, which then is distributing out to individual homes on the downlink. Could be fiber, could be jumping to coax, et cetera. I'm going to pause just a second here. There, there is a lot on this slide to take in. But the point there being is this is sort of this is kind of how we divide it up. And, and these programs, our middle mile program is focused on that distribution network. And our bead program is focused on the access network out in the last mile. So a lot of talk about bandwidth. Uh, this is a tricky one. I, I've been doing this for a long time. We have a lot of analogies. None of them are perfect. Uh, but when we talk about bandwidth, we're talking about the amount of information that can be transmitted across a given path in a unit of time. Bandwidth is often referred to as the size of the pipe. How big is the pipe or how big is the road? And we're using a, we're using a road analogy here. So uh, we kind of pick two different pictures here. There, there are two things that we can change to increase the bandwidth or be able to move more data effectively in the same amount of time. We can, using the road analogy, we can either increase the speed limit and drive faster, or we can add more lanes to the road. And both of these are viable ways to, both of these are viable ways to increase the speed that we can move data from one point to another. Uh, early on, we chased raising the speed limit. There was a lot of speed limit raising going on, but uh, in more recent decades, there's been more focus on how we create parallel paths to send more data at the same time, which is like having more lanes on the road. A uh, real simple analogy here, if a one lane road is like a one megabit per second connection, and a five lane road is like a five megabit per second connection, it will take one fifth the amount of time to move a five megabit file down the five lane road as it will to move down the one lane road. So this is bandwidth. I'm gonna go a little bit deeper. I said shallow, not a deep dive, but a little bit deeper about things that affect performance on the network. Oftentimes when we think about what problems exist that keep us from having what I call a good end user experience. We always go back to bandwidth. Well, there wasn't enough bandwidth. Interestingly enough, bandwidth is not always the problem. 
So let's talk about throughput and latency. Throughput is the amount of data the system can transmit over a, meeting in, over a medium in a specified amount of time. This is bulk bandwidth, not the, not the flow rate, which is bandwidth, but how much, how big of a piece of data we can move over a, a period of time. Uh, that throughput is measured by looking at the entire network path. So there's the link from your computer, say maybe you're using Wi-Fi to your Wi-Fi router, then there's a link from the Wi-Fi router to your modem, then through the multiple internet connections that we talked about on the slide a while back about it's going to go through multiple different provider networks and it's gonna to get to uh, the other end somewhere down the road. So all of these different network links have a different amount of bandwidth have a different amount of that capacity used at any given time. So when we take the whole path in total and say, well, how much can you realistically get through? That's the throughput. It also takes time to move data through a network. And this is, this is latency. Uh, latency, sometimes called lag, is used to describe the delay in communication over a network. Just like in our car analogy earlier, data takes time uh, to move through a network. And sometimes there is a variation in the amount of time it takes, and that's, that's called jitter. So in the BeadNOFO, we talk about reliable broadband service must have a maximum of 100 milliseconds latency measured round trip, so 50 milliseconds each way. So how would we look at this? So on the bottom of the slide here, we can see data has to move in both directions. We've got to send like from the end device uh, up to a server somewhere and then the response back to the end device. So it may take 25 milliseconds to get from our device to the server and then 20 milliseconds to get back. We add those together, that's 45 milliseconds. This is a pretty speedy connection. It would meet, it would meet our definition of reliable broadband service. So what causes this to happen? So late, latency, what causes it? Or what causes problems with throughput? So causes of network latency. First off, it's distance, folks. This stuff moves at less than the speed of light, uh, the speed of light that we normally think about as the speed of light in a vacuum. Well, when you have to move it through copper cables or fiber, it's not quite as fast. So uh, there is a factor of just how fast it is possible to move a signal. Uh, and that can make it, and that can create a problem. Bandwidth uh, and network congestion. So we talked about all of the different links that are necessary, even right now for you to see me and hear me talking to get to your computer, dozens of networks are being traversed. If one of those networks, one link in one of those networks somewhere doesn't have sufficient bandwidth to handle the amount of traffic that needs to move over the link, that can create network congestion. That congestion will cause latency to increase if it's bad enough, it will start causing packet losses to occur. When these things happen, the computers on each end slow down the speed they try to deliver the data at, which reduces throughput. Hardware misconfigurations and malfunctions uh, can also cause problems with latency. So, you know, there's a lot of equipment out there. It can get misconfigured. Sometimes, uh, sometimes an update or a patch is applied and something doesn't work out right. So misconfigurations and malfunctions definitely happen. They can contribute. And something that none of us like to admit, but we all know we've done it, end user problems might be, might be the reason. You know, my internet connection is slow, was slow this morning and it might be because of something in my house. Maybe my device doesn't have enough RAM. I had too many programs running at the same time or I've got an older laptop that didn't have much processing power or something's wrong you know, in my network. But all of this is necessary. Your computer still has to process the data it receives and the data it sends. So if, uh, if you've got a slow CPU or you're out of RAM, uh, the end user computer or the server, either one can cause, can cause latency in the network. And, and finally, there are physical issues as well. Uh, there can be damage to cables that don't cause data to stop flowing, but effectively cause it to slow down. Um, uh, copper cables can get water penetration, they can get bent, the same thing with fiber optic. 
uh, sources of latency there. Uh, wireless paths can become blocked. Uh, you know, a common problem with some wireless uh, delivery is trees grow. You might have a good path when something is first installed, uh, especially if it's fixed point to point, right? And, and three years later, um, you know, you come out of winter and you go into summer and the tree and the leaves come out on the trees and all of a sudden things got congested. Well, um, trees grow and that's a, that's a big problem for some wireless technologies. But every, no matter the delivery technology, every one of them has a challenge. Okay, another, uh, another topic to topic, talk about symmetric versus asymmetric for upload and download. Uh, so the real key takeaway here, uh, historically, a lot of our connections have been asymmetric. Uh, you know, before, I'm going to say again, you know, we say this a lot, we talk about before the pandemic, when we started, when everyone went home and tried to run multiple Zoom or team sessions at the same time for, for work and school, we really noticed this. But for a very long time, what most of us did, and to a large degree still, is we're information consumers at home. We're not information producers. You know, when, when you watch a high definition movie online, that's moving a lot more data than you typically are sending back out the connection. So asymmetric speeds make sense. And some of those asymmetric speeds allowed providers to push more of the available bandwidth on a link between two devices over some type of transmission medium. They were able to skew it. So more of the capacity went for one direction, sort of borrowing from the ability to send, uh, send data in the other direction. And this was a smart move. It helped us be able to get more downstream uh, capacity than we needed than, than upstream because that's what we use. Well, increasingly, now that we're doing so much, uh, so much video conferencing and, uh, and moving real-time media around, we find that symmetrical communications are becoming more popular and are more needed. Another thing to point out here is, is asymmetric connections tend to have more latency, especially if that upstream is a very small, uh, is a very small bandwidth associated, not much throughput on that upstream connection. Uh, that can lead to greater latency as well. And if you've got latency in one direction, recall it, it gets added in cumulatively because most of the data we move involves bi-directional communication. Even if you're just downloading a file, your computer still has to communicate with the server on the other end to indicate, yeah, I, you know, I received this data, everything's fine, nothing was corrupted, or I'm missing a piece. Could you please retransmit this segment? So there is always bi-directional communication going on. Another thing you hear a lot is dark fiber. Oh, what is this dark fiber thing? This is one of my favorites. This is one that a lot of folks don't run into unless you're in the business. Dark fiber refers to optical fiber infrastructure that hasn't been lit yet. So Optical cable implies light. A dark fiber cable is a cable that's been installed out there in the ground somewhere, but no one has connected the equipment to it that puts light on the fiber. And that equipment that puts light on the fiber defines what the capabilities of that fiber are. It can be lit with equipment that moves data very fast. It can be uh, lit with equipment that prioritizes integrity of the data and farther distances as opposed to speed. There are a lot of different ways to do this. So often what happens is there's a fiber provider network that involves an owner of the fiber and the owner of the fiber may also be a service provider that provides end user services um, or maybe not, but they do lease some of that fiber capacity out to other, uh, other entities. Typically we're not, you know, on the individual level in our homes, we're not gonna lease dark fiber, but smaller service providers or large businesses do tend to lease fiber that has been installed and owned by another entity to get between locations. Uh, why do we do this? Oftentimes it's stability. So uh, fiber tends to be leased for a long term. So one entity goes out to another and we'll do say a 20 year fixed lease on that fiber. So now when the entity that has leased the fiber needs more speed, more connectivity, it's a matter of 
equipment they need to buy to put on the ends of the fiber to light it with more capacity. So it creates, uh, it creates more stable expenses and predictable expenses for the person leasing the fiber. And it also in some ways involves less hands on the fiber. The more people that are involved in the uh, active lighting of fiber and, and being able to move data over it creates more layers where there might be maintenance that needs to be done. Say if, if an entity leases the fiber and they're the ones hooking the equipment up that puts the light on, they're hooking the rest of their network gear and their servers and stuff up to the ends and they're doing all of these functions then they know if, they're, if they need to do maintenance on the network, they can time that at a time when the network is gonna see the least amount of use, et cetera, if they need to do something, fix a piece of equipment. But when there are more layers where the fiber is owned by one entity, the light is put on by another, then another entity purchases transport service over the lit fiber network, more entities involved, takes more coordination uh, to deal with things like maintenance events, and typically when you buy a lit transport service from someone who's lit dark fiber, those tend to be shorter term agreements. So a little bit less, uh, oftentimes a little bit less uh, predictability in what their expenses are gonna be over a longer period of time. Some other important stuff about network connectivity are different topologies. And really what we're getting down to here is we're starting to get into a discussion about reliability of networks. And, and the things that we do to try to ensure that they are reliable. Because, I mean, let's face it, we are all very dependent on data networks these days. So the first one we see is the mesh topology. And kind of from left to right, these are gonna move from what we typically see closer to the core of the internet. If you'll recall a number of slides back where we talked about the internet core and the middle mile interconnect facility, then the middle mile networks out in the distribution layer and onto the access networks in the last mile. Kind of the same thing here, left to right. It's not a, it's not a perfect, it doesn't align perfectly, but generally speaking, uh, from left to right here, we work from more resilient and fault tolerant networks, architectures to less resilient. Uh, and so you tend to see the more resilient ones closer to the core. Why is that? Because core internet links may be carrying the traffic for millions of people. But the very last, you know, 100, 300, 400 foot connection to your house only carries your traffic. Well, I, I wish we were all as important as the core of the internet, but unfortunately there's some economics involved here. It's a lot, it's a lot smaller problem if one home gets disconnected than if 2 million subscribers get, uh, lose their connectivity because something went down in a middle mile interconnect facility. So in a mesh topology, oh, one, one notable caveat, there are, um, there are a number of last mile uh, networks that deliver service to the home with wireless technologies that use mesh. So that's, uh, there are a lot of exceptions uh, to this. You'll see these architectures show up sometimes in unexpected places, but, but mesh is one that is also frequently used with last mile wireless. So on a mesh, we have many, many different ways that each of these computers in the picture can talk to each other. And if one of the, well, Apologies. If one of those gets broken, then there's always multiple other ways for the data to flow. If you look at those lines, uh, you can have a lot of stuff broken in a mesh network and still have most or all of the network still functioning. Mesh networks are also real expensive because if you think about that as like long haul fiber connections, that's a lot of fiber and that's a lot of very expensive equipment that has to light that fiber at the, at the high speeds that we see in long haul networks. A really common one that we would see more in the distribution level, sometimes in the core as well, but a, a really popular distribution level technology is the ring. And in this ring, the ring functions bi-directionally. So we see data move here from one node to another that's one hop away on the ring 
and all the way around. So data can be introduced at any point on the ring and it can, it can move all the way around in the circle. Let's say we lose one connection. Well, so we have the ability to just simply move the other direction back around the ring. And these are, these are really popular. Uh, this is a really pop popular architecture that you'd see like at the regional level uh, within a state, you'd see a ring or maybe some multiple rings at the state level. The tree topology, this, this tends to get um, kind of straddled the line between smaller level distribution and uh, into last mile networks. So, and, and by the way, if you look over to the right for a second at, at star, what tree really is, is multiple stars that are interconnected together with, uh, with a common trunk line, hence the, the tree nomenclature. So this we'd call a medium resiliency network because uh, the devices that are in any of the individual stars are dependent upon a central hub node in that star, but only the devices that are in that one cluster are dependent upon the node. So in this case, if we lose a connection, a trunk connection out to one of the stars, well, only that star loses connectivity. And then finally, the star on its own, which is uh, the least amount or essentially no, no redundancy, very little resilience here. If the central node and the star is lost, then none of the devices on the network can communicate with each other. So, uh, and, and another thing I should point out is, it is rare that you will actually see, if you look at someone's network diagram, uh, their engineering documents, it is rare that you'll see a network that is just purely a mesh, purely a ring, purely tree. A lot of these topologies get mixed together in different ways uh, that help support either additional capacity or additional resilience in areas that might be more prone to failures. Uh, what's an example of this? So oftentimes we talk about um, rings within rings. So in a, in a ring network, if we have a large ring and then you sort of peel off different pieces of it and create smaller sub rings within the larger ring, what we're really talking about there is, although we might say it's, well, it's multiple rings and we have sub rings, that's also a partial mesh topology. When you think about it, we're creating not just one resilient path around a ring, but those, those smaller rings within the bigger ring create what was effectively a partial mesh. Oh, missed an animation. So what makes all of this stuff work when you bring it all together? So uh, network management, monitoring, best practices. When you're operating a network and, and you know, uh, and it, it's a little bit different than in the home where we don't do a whole lot of this, but network operators put a great deal of effort uh, and expense into network management and monitoring and the best practices associated with them. And, you know, this is monitoring equipment and not just knowing when equipment is up or down of, you know, it's really important to know if a piece of equipment is offline, but a lot more information about the equipment is being monitored and about network utilization. A good service provider wants to know what kind of utilization is on all of their network links and know what that looks like over time. That way they can do things like know when to trigger to start work on augmenting a network path to provide more bandwidth. You, you don't wanna wait until it's out of bandwidth and your customers can't uh, are complaining because things don't work. So being able to watch this over time, start to establish and view patterns as they occur, allows service providers to get ahead of the game, hopefully, and try to be able to provide continuous service you know, at, the, at a reasonable level. There's other stuff that plays into this as well. There's, uh, there are security implications in securing the network. You know, while oftentimes when we think about security, uh, one of the things we immediately think about getting your computer infected, getting a credit card number stolen, but service provider networks themselves are vulnerable to cybersecurity incidents as well. 
And a cybersecurity incident that takes a major network router somewhere offline is going to take a lot of customers offline. So there's a, a lot of stuff that goes into network management and the best practices associated with them. And this is, a, this is an area service providers really do work very hard in. So we want to mention just exactly how much there is to this. Redundancy versus resiliency. Okay, this is another, this is kind of like the broadband and high-speed internet. This is a, these are two terms that we throw around a lot and oftentimes use interchangeably. So resiliency is the ability to recover, converge, self-heal, restore normal operations after a disruptive event. This is something goes wrong. And how do we restore service? Or even if there's a problem, maybe the end user never even sees a problem with the service. Maybe the restoration is so fast and so baked in that it occurs without anyone even noticing there was a problem. In order to attain that kind of resiliency in a network, we need to have redundant elements, that is um, redundant paths. So if there's a problem with one path, then you have another one available. But I also want to point out that just having redundancy doesn't necessarily give you resilience. We have two pictures here. In figure one, you see two buildings and an underground pipe or a conduit connected between them. Uh, there is, uh, in this case, there are two fiber optic cables that are used in that single underground conduit. They go to a single demarcation point in each building. A demarcation point is where we jump from the, the outside longer distance connection into the network that is in the building. A home network, if it's a business, we'd, that's where you typically hear the term enterprise LAN comes in for enterprise local area network. So in this case, what do we have? We do have redundancy with the two fibers, but we don't have a great deal of resiliency because if something happens to the single conduit, we're gonna lose both fibers. And then we still don't have resilience. If something happens in the DMARC room or DMARC closet in one of those buildings, chances are that's going to affect both of the connections. So again, redundancy without resilience. In the second picture, we depict a separate DMARC location in each building, so a separate location physically separated in the building that connects into the building's network and a separate path for that underground pipe for the second fiber optic cable to run through. So when you kind of logically think this through now, we have a problem with one of the conduits, it doesn't affect the other. There's a problem with one of the DMARCs, it doesn't affect the other. So here is an example where we use redundancy to create network resilience. Whereas in, in the first one, yeah, there, there are some failures in the first one where, uh, where the amount of redundancy that was provided would create resiliency, but nowhere near what we get in the second one. And res redundancy to create resiliency is expensive. It is, I mean, because by the very definition of the word redundancy, we're duplicating elements in the network that aren't necessary if everything is working correctly. So that, uh, that can, in cases, that can more than double the cost of a network operation to create that resilience. This is the nerdiest we're gonna get. Uh, hang with me for a minute and I will bring this back in just a minute to something that makes a little more sense. There is a, an academic reference model that's the OSI model for open systems interconnect that describes seven different layers for a data network. In the IIJA programs, we talk about middle mile bead. What we're really focusing on here in these programs is the first three layers in this model. In all cases, each layer is completely abstracted from the layer above and below it. And that's what I'm going to try to demonstrate and then wrap up in a reason why this is important. So the data link layer 
can use a completely different physical layer, can have completely different physical layers underneath it, but still operate the same way, regardless of what's going on the physical layer. It's the job of the physical layer to abstract the details of what's inside it from its presentation to data link. Same way with data link to network. And it works the other way as well. The physical layer shouldn't have to care or have any knowledge about how the data link layer does what it does to do its job. So what do we mean by these layers? This is very nebulous at the moment. So physical layer, layer one, this is the physical medium used to transmit data. This could be fiber optic cable, could be coaxial cable, twisted pair. It could be the, uh, the uh, path through the atmosphere and into space for a satellite. It could be the path between two ground stations for microwave. There's that physical, that physical path, the physical medium, and whatever the ba most basic methodology is for putting some kind of signal on it. So for fiber, it's fiber with light on the fiber, but it doesn't really specify useful data transmission, just the medium itself, and then the signal that we're going to put on that can be recovered, transmitted on one end and recovered on the other. Data link layer, layer two, this is where we get a little bit of intelligence in the network. This is where we create those frames I talked about earlier, and we are going to package up bits and bytes of data. We're going to put them in the frames, and then we're going to uh, then we're going to transmit them out onto the physical layer. And then the physical layer is responsible for that analog modulation that moves it down the line. Data link layer is important because the data link layer allows us to connect two different physical layers together. Unless you're gonna have one really long fiber optic cable that goes from your computer to every endpoint you wanna communicate with, you have to have data link layer devices. Uh, you know, in the case of where I'm at right now, I've got a wired Ethernet connection from the computer I'm using to present on that runs to my own Wi-Fi router in the, in the basement of my house. So that is a physical medium that's copper cable and its data link layer is Ethernet. And that date and that date one data link runs down to that Wi-Fi router. Uh, there's some more stuff that goes on the router. It also connects with another discrete data link layer, another Ethernet connection between it and my modem. But the interesting thing here is data link layer uh, devices, switching devices at OSI layer two can't switch between different kinds of technology. That's not what they're designed to do. They terminate one kind of technology. So if you've got two different ethernet links, an ethernet switch or a hub can transmit data between them. But oftentimes we don't get very far before we change technologies. For example, fiber to the home. So as soon as I get on the other side of my modem, I'm running through a PON network actually. It is an X, known as an XGS PON network. Uh, it's capable of a maximum of 10 gigabits per second bi-directional. That is not the speed that I have subscribed to. Or, or is even offered to me, but it is a different kind of data link layer. And my ethernet switch does not understand that. So the device that we use to mediate between those different kinds of data link layer, which also use different kinds of physical medium, is the router that operates at, network, at the network layer or OSI layer three. This is where you hear about IP packets. These are where the IP packets live. And this is where the real magic happens. The router is able to take the IP packet out of the ethernet, say ethernet frame or the pawn frame, and then bridge it across the device and put it into a different kind of data link layer or the same on the other side. Routers also typically have uh, the ones we use in our homes don't, but larger ones have many different interfaces on them. They make intelligent decisions by having some information called a routing table in them that describes which different interfaces on the router can get to different destinations across the internet. So the, the real magic comes in here. But the beauty here is for a router to transmit and route data from one network segment to another, it doesn't 
have to understand the underlying data link layer. That's the job of OSI layer two and layer one, et cetera. That is a pretty beefy concept and a little bit nebulous, but it is the very basis for how all of this stuff works. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time going through it. And some of that, I think, maybe helps understand the different broadband connection types and how all of this fits together to realize that there are these well-defined layers that, that are designed different pieces of equipment or different functions too. Now, I will say before we go on, oftentimes those different layers, they're not a real hard line. Many network devices will function at more than one layer. For example, a router really tends to function at all three. It has to have physical medium connections to it, like copper or fiber. It has to have data link layer information, such as Ethernet or PON or DOCSIS. And then it has to move IP packets. So as you crawl up the stack, if you will, the higher level you get, typically those devices also include processing at the layers below them. So some broadband connection types, and this might also be viewed as different. So this involves different physical mediums, and this involves different data links. But the one thing that is universal across the entire internet, I said the magic is at OSI layer three, the network layer, it's all IP data. So we might change what physical medium we go through, we might change the data link, but it's all IP packets, and that's how it works end to end. And here we see several different kinds. We depict aerial deployments, which could be fiber, could be copper. Um, fiber and copper can also be underground. It can be a buried deployment. Uh, there are different splice points or junction points where it may go from in the ground to aerial or aerial to back in the ground. Uh, and then there's also paths through the air where we see uh, microwave or wireless equipment. So uh, cable, coax systems. Coax systems were originally installed for cable TV. They were then modified with new technologies that allow them to transmit uh, data to provide internet services. And that uh, typically, historically, those cable, coaxial cable-based internet products are asymmetric due to the technology used. And I talked about borrowing from one direction to make room for the other. That's exactly how they work. Um, we'll see we'll see cables deployed um, on poles that can be either coax or could be fiber. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's more cost effective if poles already exist, but it really does depend on the geography. We oftentimes will see almost exclusively fiber optic cable from some uh, place. If this is a smaller town, there's likely one or more places on the edge of town that might just be one of those little concrete buildings you see be beside the si uh, highway, which is a connection point to a middle mile network that may run into town to an area node, which is where we really kind of pass off into the last mile technologies and the last mile provider. So here we have jumps in the medium from fiber to uh, coax or fiber to fiber, but we've changed the kind of data link layer that we use to pass information, you know, how we fan out fiber networks locally from in, in a local environment to homes is very different than what we do to transmit large amounts of data very long distances over fiber. And then working my way around the diagram, of course, we've got wireless systems everywhere. Uh, and you know, wireless systems incorporate point-to-point -point fixed terrestrial wireless, not specifically depicted, could be satellite, and also all of our cell phone networks. Uh, I know sometimes wireless networks uh, get a little bit of a bad time, but I, I certainly enjoy being able to carry this with me everywhere and have access. A common thing that uh, we run into in broadband deployments is buried versus aerial uh, optical cable. In some cases, the same could be true for copper. This is typically, but this is typically a fiber issue. And uh, a question that I've been asked many times is what is better, 
burying fiber optic cable or hanging it aerially. And the point is that uh, neither one is universally better than the other. They both have strengths and weaknesses. Um, aerial cable is, if they're already existing utility poles and there's space available, sometimes it can be very easy and cost-effective to go hang more cable on existing poles, not always. Uh, it tends to be, but it tends to be more susceptible to weather and climate events uh, hanging up in the air off of utility poles. Uh, buried cable tends to be more resilient, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more resilient to those climate events, but is also more expensive to deploy. And when things do happen, uh, I think the example that we almost always use is a backhoe cutting into the fiber optic cable. Uh, but when it does get cut, it's also typically more complicated and expensive to repair and timely to repair as well. So uh, the key takeaway here is with, with broadband deployments is, you know, if you see somebody hanging that fiber on poles in your neighborhood and somebody else's neighborhood's got buried, that doesn't mean that they're getting something better than you or you're getting something better than they have. It's really based on the specific application and the economics of that application. And speaking of which, the last segment today, and then we'll have some time for questions, is broadband economics. So some, some basic economics, and I am an engineer, I am not an economist, so hang with me here. There are two kinds of expenditures that we typically see in any kind of operation. We have our capital expenditures, or CapEx. This is the money we have to spend up front to build infrastructure. That could be to build a building, that could be to build fiber network, whatever it is, uh, you're going to have a capital expenditure to build your infrastructure. And then there are operational expenses that, that uh, involve the day-to-day -day ongoing recurring costs of, of operating a network in this case. Uh, so, you know, material, land, labor, um, engineering, permitting, equipment, that's all capital power, network maintenance. Um, sometimes there are fees if, uh, if, uh, if a network operator is, is purchasing transport service, say a local access provider is buying transport from another provider to get from their network uh, up to uh, an internet exchange point, that would be an operational expense. In the context of the IIJA programs uh, and uh, beat and the middle mile specifically, these programs are funding, uh, not exclusively, but for the most part, these programs are about funding capital expenses and not about operational expenses. So if you are in the industry or you're with a state or local government and you're looking at working with providers, please remember that for the most part, these programs are not offsetting those businesses' operational expenses, but only assisting with the capital expenses required to deploy infrastructure. Now, when we're talking about deploying infrastructure, we commonly talk about either brownfields or greenfields. A brownfield is a case where there is some existing infrastructure already, and we are uh, and we're going to add additional or upgrade the infrastructure. You know, a really easy example of a brownfield would be a case of. There are already existing utility poles out there, and all we have to do is hang more fiber on them. Whereas a green field is starting from scratch. Uh, in cases where it's possible to find a brownfield opportunity, brownfield opportunities tend to be much less expensive than green fields because in in uh, in a, any kind of a broadband deployment, it's the civil works that tend to cost the majority of the money. It's not the cost of the fiber it's the cost of putting the fiber in the ground that is the greatest. So brownfields stretch money a lot farther than greenfields. So if there's, if there's already infrastructure available, the funding tends to go a lot farther. Open access, this is, um, this is a relatively new concept. So historically, we would tend to see one business or one service provider that built the entire network. They would build you know, the local access network that goes out to homes and businesses. They would build that back to their access point. They would build their local presence, you know, a cable head in to telco central office, whatever that is. And then they would, and then they would uh, build or do long-term leases for 
uh, for physical infrastructure that connect them uh, farther upstream in the network to the internet and they own all of it and they run all of it. Open access introduces the concept that it may not necessarily be one entity that owns all of that. So, in, uh, and, and there are so many different ways that open access can work. We certainly cannot cover all of them. So we're gonna cover kind of some examples of how this may work, but this is certainly not an exhaustive list. So um, in that case is you might have one owner for the underlying infrastructure that owns, owns that infrastructure and then you might have another business entity that provides service over that infrastructure. So you'd have a network owner operator, and then you might have a retail service provider that's building and providing the service itself, handling the customers, et cetera. One of the ways this manifests itself, especially uh, where it has been successful, is at time, and this again, this is one example, the entity that may build the infrastructure might be an entity of government. It might be a, a city or a county or a state that builds infrastructure. And then they might allow that infrastructure to be used at, um, if it's a government entity, it could be below wholesale prices, but they allow uh, anyone, any service provider that wants to use that infrastructure can purchase it at a wholesale rate where everyone pays the same amount of level playing field with uh, uh, non-discriminatory access to the assets. So the economics, or, or it could be a for-profit company as well, the economics of the network infrastructure itself are separated with the economics of the retail ISP business. This is uh, in, in the middle mile, in the middle mile program and in middle mile assets that are constructed under the bead program, it is a requirement that middle mile assets be made available under open access arrangements. So if uh, say you're a provider and you are getting money from a state that's an eligible entity to build a piece of network and you have to build some middle mile to make that last mile network work, that provider would be obligated under the programs to make access to the, to the assets that they are not using on the piece of that network that is middle mile available at a non-discriminatory non non wholesale price to others. I am certainly not going to go through the items on these slides. I'll say a few words while they're up on the screen. Uh, and what I really want to say is if anyone, you know, you download the slide deck later and you really dig into the stuff, the point I want to make here is these are not absolute numbers. These are generic guideline numbers that we have compiled from multiple different data sources to try to indicate what a typical range of costs are for fiber optic deployments. You see aerial, you see underground, uh, you see brownfield versus greenfield. You see different types of geography, uh, different population densities included here. So this, we think this is pretty good data, but the thing I want to caution against is if you're involved in broadband, uh, if you're involved in broadband projects to provide high-speed internet and you're working with someone and a price falls outside of a limit you see here, that doesn't necessarily mean something's wrong. What that means is there may be a mitigating circumstance why that price is different. But, but these are fairly typical and should be a good guideline to follow. A little bit more information about uh, rurality or density of, of, uh, of geography and what the costs and, and what the unserved and underserved segments are in those areas. So uh, when, you have, uh, when you have a type of geography, say, are unconnected urban, dense rural, sparse suburb, and remote rural. We have some data here on the, the percentage of those serviceable locations that are either underserved or unserved. And, and recall for the purposes of our programs, unserved doesn't mean they have no service. It means the service is less than 25.3 or is provided by some specific technologies that, that do not meet the uh, definition of reliable broadband.
a little bit more data where we see common types of buildouts. You'll see here things like where aerial uh, is common. Interestingly enough, um, we tend to see more underground construction, it tends to be in more densely populated areas. And as you get into sparser areas, it's more likely to be aerial. And of course, uh, technologies like fiber to the home or really any technology as population gets more sparse, the, uh, the cost per home pass increases with uh, as density decreases. These slides, by the way, are available publicly, so you can look at them later. And if you signed up for the webinar at, uh, by going through uh, the Broadband USA website, that is the repository where they're located. There are also links to get to these things uh, for most of the assets at internetforall.gov. That uh, brings us at uh, one hour and 10 minutes. So we've got about uh, 20 minutes left for questions. And it concludes the formal part of the presentation today. Great. Thanks, Court. Um, I know every time I see a presentation like that, I learned something new. And today it was about dark fiber. So I, I know there's been a lot of really nice uh, messages in the chat saying how useful this is. And uh, just going back to, to what Court said, the, the presentation, um, usually it's it's posted as a PDF and the recording uh, should be up on the Broadband USA and Internet for All websites by the end of the week. And I will put a link in the chat again. I've put it in there a couple of times, but I'll put it in there again so you'll know where to go either tomorrow or Friday to uh, look for these resources. And we encourage you to share it widely uh, share it with your colleagues, your friends, because um, it really is a great resource to dive into um, later. And I know this was a lot to take in in, in an hour and 10 minutes. So we appreciate you hanging on. Um, and before we get started, I also want to introduce another one of our colleagues, Scott Lively, who will also be helping us today um, answer some of the questions that have been coming in. He is a part of our technical assistance team, um, so he will be helping us as well. Um, and also to, to give Court a break, I'm actually going to ask Scott the first question. Um, so Scott, if you can tell us, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, information about the new FCC national broadband map that uh, recently was published, I believe, uh, November 18th. And the question is, how are the new FCC maps uh, an improvement on the previous mapping efforts? Thank you very much, Macy. Thanks also to Court for the excellent presentation. I, I too, always uh, learn a lot when Court has the microphone. Um, we got a bunch of questions. We're going to try to get to as many as we can. Um, I did want to say some things about mapping quickly. We got a few questions about that. It's obviously very timely. Um, as Macy mentioned, the FCC made its maps public for the first time recently. Uh, so that is a very momentous development. The FCC maps will be used to determine how much money each state receives on top of its base 100 million allocation, and then the FCC map will serve as an input when each state runs its own challenge process to determine which locations are eligible for bead funding. So please do look into uh, the FCC challenge processes. Uh, individuals can look up the address or their residence, or if you have a small business, uh, see what you think of the information on there. Individuals can challenge both fabric and broadband availability data. As most of you are well aware, the, the broadband availability data pertains to whether a service is offered for sale at that location. So uh, a, a speed test uh, that conflicts with the service that's offered for sale, say a, a carrier offers 100 over 20, uh, if you have a speed test that conflicts with that, that's not actually a challenge to the FCC map because the FCC map only depicts broadband availability, what is offered for sale. Um, when the state runs its own challenge process for the BEAD program to determine which locations are eligible, then it can look at other sources of information such as speed tests and so forth. But again, please do look at those FCC challenge processes. Individuals can challenge both location fabric and availability data and entities that have access to more data such as governments or ISPs can make those challenges in bulk. 
And those challenge processes are there to improve the maps over time and to, to make them as accurate as possible. And the FCC has already taken a big step in that direction by making uh, the data much more granular than it's ever been. No more uh, is it considered uh, a census block to be served because one location is served. Now we have the location fabric that identifies every single location in the country uh, that could be served with broadband. So uh, the data is more granular and the idea is to get the map as updated and accurate as possible uh, by continuously making and resolving challenges. So I've gone on long enough about mapping. Um, I think we can get to some of the questions now that uh, pertain more directly to some of the uh, technical uh, know-how that court was providing. No, oh, no worries. I mean, there are whole webinars done on mapping, so we could talk about it all day. Um, but there was a follow-up question of somebody asked um, to put in the link for the FCC national broadband map. So I will definitely put that in the chat. Encourage you all to go and look at your addresses to make sure it is properly um, notified in the, in the system, whether it's served or not. It, I can't stress that enough. Uh, we will share that in the link. But for now, um, a, a lot a lot of questions actually were from our friends in Alaska about microwaves. Um, so there was someone who said they're, they're in an Alaskan community on an island and microwave, microwave has been used and still is. So they wanted to know how much data can a microwave middle mile handle? And just uh, to talk about microwaves link capacity, throughput and latency in general. Oh boy, that that's a big one. <laughs> I think <laughs> if it it's up. okay, I think I'm going to answer that and a couple other things that involve middle mile and wireless. I saw there were several things that kind of converged on that. So um, it is really difficult to say just point blank that that microwave wireless can handle X amount of capacity because there is a great deal of ver there's a huge amount of variation. Uh, microwave isn't just one term. The frequency that the radios operate at, uh, licensed versus unlicensed, what frequency band, the size of the channels, and there has been an, a, a really a great deal of science advancement in the last decade that, you know, of course it takes time after it works in a lab, it takes time to make that work in the real world. So uh, those numbers and, and the work that I do are the biggest moving target, honestly, the biggest moving target out there. Capacity with things like fiber is pretty easy to figure out, but wireless is, is uh, a different story. The, the one thing I'll say on it that is pretty universal though, that the higher capacity and the lower latency, the shorter the distance. So if it's a question about wireless, really the thing, the, the best generalization I can give on capacity, latency, and that sort of thing is the, the better it's going to work, the more capacity, the lower latency, the shorter the hops are going to be. And if it's a situation where you need to span a larger distance with it, that's going to become more challenging. But multi gigabit speed is not, is not a problem for modern licensed point to point wireless technologies. Uh, there was another one about, there was some stuff in there about, about the new low earth orbit satellite systems. Okay, so they are uh, the biggest problem with geosynchronous orbit satellites is that latency starts at about half a second, just because of the distance that satellite is from the Earth. The thing that low Earth orbit really promises, uh, the big one of the big things it promises is a much lower latency as those satellites are much closer. Uh, but the thing I think I have to say about that is the, uh, to my knowledge, the companies that are marketing low Earth orbit satellite services are last mile services. Those are not middle mile services. Uh, those satellites, because they're not geosynchronous and because they're moving through the sky, have to have data fed to them by ground stations. And those ground stations are uh, scattered all across the landscape. So I would say that uh, typically I would call the terrestrial connection to the satellite ground station for low earth orbit, the middle mile, and the low Earth orbit system, a last mile technology. So I hope that helps with one of those. Uh, and I'll just throw something else in here about, mi about middle mile because it, it feels similar. There was a question with middle mile about the cost and a formula or a calculation for what middle mile costs. <sighs> geography, geography, geography. 
Um, the, the problem with middle mile, uh, the, the problem, well, one of the big problems with middle mile, okay, so it runs a long distance. So it has a lot to do typically with the, ge uh, the geology. If you've got ground that's easy to trench in or to bore through, the cost of middle mile can literally be a tiny fraction of if you've got rock that you've got to bore through. So geology has a whole lot to do with it. And unfortunately, there just isn't a kind of a rule of thumb for middle mile deployment. Now, what I will say is if you're involved in middle mile and all hope is not lost here, I would go look to entities more locally to the area that that deployment's gonna be in because chances are someone has put fiber in, maybe not in the exact path you need, maybe not to the extent that you need it, but somebody has put fiber in, in that area somewhere. If you can find them and they're willing to talk to you, uh, you might be able to learn something about what the local geology took. And if you can find some data, it's typically not too difficult to extrapolate a reasonable cost based on other projects for the same uh, geology in the same area. I, I think I knocked out about three or four there. Thank you. Those were good questions. No, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, the next question I have here, actually, I think I can handle myself. Um, somebody asked, how can local community leaders like elected officials engage with programs to get broadband deployed faster? Um, they like, for example, someone uh, emailed the state broadband office in their area, um, but wondering whether there's a federal contract that their village can work with as well. And we actually at NTIA have federal program officers. So we have one dedicated to each state that is working very closely with the state broadband offices within uh, each state and territories too, uh, excuse me, also territories to work with them, uh, building those relationships, making sure that uh, they're coordinating with uh, you know, the groups on the ground that are doing um, doing work. So if I can just show you guys real quickly, I think you might find this uh, beneficial. It's our, our Internet for All map that we just deployed uh, not too long ago on our Internet for All website. And here you can go in and there's a map at the bottom. So you can click on a state, like right now I selected American Samoa, and you can see who the federal program officer is. So you can email that person. Um, in this case, it's Ethan Link at ntia.gov. We also have a contact for the state broadband office you can reach out to specifically. And then if you just have general inquiries about some of the internet for all programs like the BEAD program or any of our Digital Equity Act programs, um, there are the more general uh, inboxes and you'll have somebody on the NTIA side um, monitoring those those uh, inboxes to respond uh, with any inquiries you may have. So really useful little tool there. I'll put a link in the chat as well, uh, but highly encourage you all to utilize that um, as you can. Uh, I know we have a little bit more time. Um, so there's another question here that says, what is the advantage of having a POP in a very rural area? Is there a quality improvement for users? Oh, oh, can I have that one? I like yeah, that. Yeah, take it. Uh, so I, I'm going to say this is, this is one of the difficulties of doing a large webinar like this because um, POP can mean different things to different people. So I'm going to apologize if I do not use, uh, if I do not use POP in quite the way that the, the person who asked that uh, thinks of it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at this as the advantage of having some type of point of presence that gets access to um, larger internet providers like an internet exchange or uh, the stuff that I talked about being in the middle mile and the core middle mile facilities. I'm gonna talk about the advantage of, of pushing that out to more rural areas because there's been a lot of talk about that. Um, how do we get like internet exchange points out of the large metro centers and push those farther out into, into less populated areas? Um, there is some advantage. There is some advantage to that. The, advantage, uh, the advantages though are not always immediately obvious. I mean, you still, it's not likely that an exchange or a pop in a more rural area is going to carry the kind of volume of content that you're going to be plugged into from a content delivery network and a larger one. 
Uh, but yes, there is content that does bring content closer to the end user. When content comes closer to the end user, uh, then that is bandwidth over the middle mile network, that the traditional middle mile network that doesn't have to be used. Those kind of points of presence, those facilities also create, tend to create resilience because there are typically multiple paths to them and a larger point of presence and exchange points. So we can get some bandwidth offload from middle mile network from those points of presence back to the bigger, bigger exchange points. There is typically added resiliency because we have additional network paths that didn't used to exist. So ice storm, backhoe, whatever things stay up. And uh, in some cases it may incentivize uh, different network operators to share information between their networks at a more local level, which bypasses the need. I mean, anyone who lives in a rural area, I'm and full disclosure, I'm in Kansas uh, and I've been in Kansas my whole life. Uh, and most of that time was in a much more rural area than I'm in now. You know, we talk about why did that data have to go to Atlanta to get from me to someone on the other side of my state? Well, uh, by putting points of presence or exchange points more, uh, distributing smaller ones farther out, we see more opportunity for local interchange of data. So it doesn't, so one, it doesn't congest networks over farther paths, but two, it's more paths uh, that, the that the data can take, shorter paths and short paths make good, make for good end user experience. The closer you can be, closer being speed wise to data, the better the end user experience will be. Sorry, long-winded long -winded answer, but that is a, that's a good one. That's a really big deal. Figuring out what the sweet spot is for just how many of those and how big they need to be uh, is, is really a really interesting conundrum and one that I really hope we see the funding in these programs uh, get some more of those deployed and we learn more about where the best kind of, what the best kind of spacing looks like. Great, oh my gosh, we are already at time. I I apologize if we didn't get to your question. There were so many really good ones. I know we didn't even get to talk about Ariel and Buried and uh, there were just really great questions. Um, so I, I encourage you to reach out uh, to your FPO and also to our, inner, our our general inboxes too. If you have any questions, we have internetforall.gov. Uh, sorry, internet for all at ncia.gov to submit general questions. I know a lot of questions are answered um, on internet for all.gov um, about the programs, um, about there's FAQ documents on there, uh, TA resources, technical assistance resources. So really great place to go check it out. Um, and oh, somebody said the FCC has a webinar that starts in two minutes. So go support our agency friends over at FCC to check that out. Um, and just know that this presentation will be posted on the Broadband USA website and Internet for All websites by the end of the week. Let me repost that link because I know folks have been asking for it one more time. And also, um, just know that we have um, another upcoming webinar on, it's it's a similar vein, but it's on permitting. That'll be December 14th, so I encourage you all to go on to our uh, Broadband USA Internet for All websites to sign up for that. Um, so with that, we're at four o'clock. Thanks to Court and thanks to Scott for being here with me today. And uh, we will see you all next time. Thanks so much.